Chapter 26, Convict Baseball, same day, Wednesday, April 24th, 1935. Natalie, my mouth tries to say, but my throat is closed up tight. No sound comes out. I run down my arms, flying helter-skelter, the shale shaking. She has to be here. Maybe she's out scouting for more stones. That's it. I look down by the small rocky beach. A crab scuttles out from under a rock. Men on a nearby ferry are laughing. The sound is eerily loud, though the boat is far away. She isn't there. Over by the red berry bushes, no. Back by the greenhouse, no. Which way do I go? I stop and listen. A voice, sounds, behind me. I spin and run, run toward the voice. Natalie! I crash the thicket, and then I see her. Natalie sitting on a rock with someone, a man. He's wearing a denim shirt and denim pants, a con. Natalie is sitting with a con. The scream is stuck in my throat, choking me. Don't look away, don't blink, do not blink. The con is smiling. He's missing a front tooth. There are dark, greased comb marks in his hair. I wonder about this. Inmates aren't allowed hair pomade. Suddenly, this seems very important. Why is he wearing pomade on his hair? Maybe he isn't a con. Please, God, don't let him be a con. I haven't even looked at Natalie. I'm afraid to take my eyes off the guy in the denim shirt. I think somehow I can protect her this way. But now I watch her, too. She's smiling. Sometimes Nat looks concerned or sad or raging mad. The best she ever looks is interested. But here's my sister, Natalie Flanagan, looking happy. Hey, Moose. The con's voice is scratchy and an octave too high, like a girl's almost. You want this? He reaches inside the coat draped over his leg. He has a gun. I can't breathe. He's going to shoot. But then I see. Information seeps into my brain. It isn't a gun. It's a baseball. Suddenly, my throat opens up. Get a away! Get the heck away! Go, go, that's my sister! Get away from her! I scream as the four o'clock count whistle blows. The con jumps, and Natalie's, Natalie's smile, like some kind of rare bird sighting, slips away. Take it easy, fella. I got your baseball, didn't I? The con says. He nods at me and turns to Natalie. Bye, sweetie. He closes Natalie's fingers around the baseball and fast walks away. Do not, do not call her sweetie! I shout. His pace is uneven, like one leg is shorter than the other. Then I see the number stamped on the back of his denim shirt, 105. 27, idiot. Same day, Wednesday, April 24th, 1935. Nothing happened. I say this out loud to shut up the voice in my head. My teeth are chattering like I'm cold. They were just sitting there. There's no law against that, but I can't stop thinking what the warden told me the first week we came here. Some of these convicts haven't seen a woman in 10 or 15 years. I think you're old enough to understand what that means. I was only gone two minutes, three minutes, maybe. No more. N-O-M-O-R-E. N-O-T-H-I-N-G. H-A-P-P-E-N-E-D. The words go around and around in my head, like the wheels of a car rolling over the slats of a bridge. But it was more than three minutes, way more. I left right after the three o'clock count whistle. I returned before the next. I was probably gone 45 minutes. No, I left way after the three o'clock whistle. It was only 10 minutes, no more. Calm down, I tell myself, nothing happened. My mind flashes on the greasy haired con holding my sister's hand and a sick feeling comes over me. My mouth tastes like curdled milk. I don't know what happened, I wasn't there. I'm so upset, I hardly see what, where I'm going. Natalie is pulling back, trying to go slow. I tug her along, I don't care what she wants. We're almost to the west stairs now, and I'm not even sure how we got here. It's like I dreamed the distance. He, how did he know my name? How did he know what I was looking for? He had that ball with him. He must have known before. 105. That was the number that didn't make sense. Idiot. I am an idiot. Natalie must have said something the last time. The last time we were over here. Could that be? He must have left before I saw him then. Probably meant, meant to today, but he brought the ball insurance, I guess. Figured he could buy me off. I grip Natalie's arm so tight it feels as if I'm holding bone. She tries to twist her arm away, but I'm not about to let go. Ever. She balks, stops, refuses to be half dragged when we both know she follows just fine without this. But I won't give her even this much freedom. What's the matter with you? Don't you know the first thing about anything? I scream. Come on, can't you just walk with me for once? Almost there. Almost there. I'm going to cry, and I sure as heck don't want to do it out here. I pray Teresa isn't there waiting. I don't want to find her sitting outside our door. We turn the corner to our landing and my chest falls. Someone is there. Piper. Oh man, just what I need. 
Piper's hat is tipped to the side. She's watching me out of the corners of her eyes. You were chewing out Natalie. You were yelling at her, Piper said. I wasn't. Yes, you were. I heard you. You never yell at her. What's going on, she demands. I keep my mouth shut and stare at the doorknob, wishing I could get Piper out of the way. Piper looks at Natalie. Natalie is rubbing her chin on her shoulder, her chin on her shoulder faster than normal, as if she's upset too. Have I done this, or was it 105? She seemed happy with that greasy-haired con, so it was probably me. Sweet Jesus, Piper whistles one long note. You found a ball. That's one of ours, isn't it? She holds her hand out to Natalie. Natalie can be very possessive with her things. She would never give anyone a rock or a button. I think Piper will be in for a fight. But no. Natalie plops the ball in Piper's hand, easy as can be. Where did you find it? I don't look Piper in the face. I feel like I held my sister hostage for that stupid baseball. I won't touch it. It's dirty. The last thing in the world I want is to tell anyone how we got it. And Piper's ten times worse than just anyone. How could I have let this happen? 105, Natalie says. I say nothing. It feels like all the blood is draining out of my face. I'm lightheaded. Please, Piper, be as stupid as I was. Piper is frowning. She's trying to understand. Do not figure this out. Do not figure this out. 105 what? Piper asks. She pushes the brim of her hat back as if to see better. She's staring intently at Natalie. Natalie says nothing. Good, Natalie. We gotta go inside. I touch the door. It feels good, that door. I can almost hear the sound it will make when it slams shut. Come on! 105 what? Is that how many places you looked? What? Piper asks. She's standing firm between me and the door. Her hands are crossed in front of her, and the frilly blouse she wore to school is tucked inside her overalls. Even as upset as I am right now, some part of me registers how cute she is. Because I haven't heard of a ball going over in months. I didn't think you'd find one, Piper says. Thanks a lot, I snort. You could have told me that. You know I've been looking. I'm your babysitter now, too. Pocket, Natalie says, picking wildly at her shoulder. Pocket, Nat Piper asks me. Usually I don't like it when people talk to Natalie through me. I'm not a ventriloquist, and Natalie is, is not my dummy. But today, I want her mute. She doesn't mean anything by that, I lie. Yellow buttons, Natalie says, taking two buttons out of her pocket. Natalie's upset. We need to go inside. I try to edge Piper out of the way, but Piper isn't budging. Stop, Natalie. You have to tell me. Piper recrosses her arms in front of her chest. She's pulling rank. Only Natalie couldn't care less whose daughter Piper is. 105, Natalie says. 105 buttons? Piper squints. She looks at Natalie, then me, then Natalie again. A big, slow smile pours across her face. Oh, sweet Jesus, you don't mean... I twist the knob and try to, try to knee open our door. You got a con to give you a ball, didn't you? How did you do that? And who the heck is AZ-105? Somebody on the dock? I have to know. I have the door open and I'm trying to pull Natalie inside while keeping Piper out. Was it a waiter at the officer's club? Was it? Natalie, come on. Wow, Moose, I never thought you'd do something like this. She smiles big. My insides boil up and I barely restrain myself from slugging her. I push Natalie inside our apartment. Then I try to get past Piper. What did you give him for the ball? Piper asks. I've got my shoulders in and I'm trying to close the door now. If only I can get Piper's fingers out of there. Come on, you must have given him something, Piper asks. Move your hand and shut up, I cry. This is amazing, Piper says, her eyes glowing. I've never seen her so excited. Think maybe he could get autographs too, Moose? Because Al Capone's signature, that is worth a fortune. This is the beginning, Moose. No, this is the end. I shut the door in her face. Chapter 28, tall for her age. Same day, Wednesday, April 24th, 1935. The thing to do is come clean. Talk to my mom, talk to my dad, tell them. They'll understand it was an accident. Three minutes, five at the most, my mom said to treat Nat like a regular sister. Well, I certainly would have a regular sister for five minutes. My mom can't be mad. Together, we'll work out the right thing to do so this will never happen again. I can hear my mom's footsteps on the landing. She bursts in the door. Look, Moose! She waves a newspaper in the air. She slaps it on the table. See, didn't I tell you what a wonderful program they have? It's world famous. It, look, it says it right here. New hope for kids with mental deficiencies, the headline reads. There's a picture of Mr. Purdy standing in front of the Esther P. Marinoff and a small close-up of a boy. Tom, age 10, was mute when he came to the Esther P. Marinoff. But now he speaks in simple sentences and reads at a third grade level, the caption 